Hello! In this video, I'm going to run Ethernet to my front room using network cable that's already in my walls. As with any home improvement project video, uh, watch the whole thing and determine which tools you need and uh, determine how my solution applies to your home. Every home is a little bit different, so take what you can from my video and uh, apply it to your home and continue your research. Well, let's get started. The coaxial ports in my home carry a modulated telephone signal that my internet service provider uses to get me internet. This modulated signal must go through a modem in order for me to use it as internet. The word modem stands for modulator demodulator and is used to send a digital signal over an analog telephone line in this case. Uh, once a modulated signal passes through a modem, it can be used as internet. So I can plug in my desktop computer or my home Wi-Fi router and broadcast that signal as internet to be used by all of the devices in my home. When we moved in, I noticed that we had three phone jacks and three coaxial jacks. Here's just a little drawing of my house, living room, kitchen. So the three phone jacks were in the kitchen, the master bedroom, and the front room. The three coaxial jacks were in, sorry, three coaxial ports were in the master, the living room, and the guest room. And here's my network box up here. So, my wife and I don't have a home phone. Those jacks to better use. We wanted to create an office in our front room for a while, and I like to game, so I wanted Ethernet running to that desktop computer. So the plan is to get the modulated signal at the coaxial port in the master room, feed it to the phone jack, which will turn into an ethernet port. That'll go out through the network box and back in through this phone jack, which will be an ethernet port. And we can have our computer in the front room. A lot of homes nowadays are wired with category five network cable for their home phone lines, even though this is overkill. Category 5 network cable can support data transmission speeds of up to 100 megabits a second over distances of up to 328 feet or 100 meters. And it can do even better than this on shorter distances. Phone cables from the wall to the phone use two parallel wires. This causes interference or noise, especially over long distances. Category 3 and 5 wire use four twisted pairs of wires that help reduce noise over longer distances. As you'd expect, Category 5 does this better than Category 3. There is a newer standard that started being used in the middle of Category 5E that improves noise reduction by shielding the four twisted pairs in the metal conducted barrier. My home has Category 5 wiring, so my front office should still have at least 100 megabits per second connection. There are a couple of different types of wall plates for network connections. Uh, there are some kinds that have the snap-in connector that you can stick into the wall plate. I know mine didn't have those, so I purchased two of the kind that you'll see in the video where the network port is attached to the wall plate. Just as I said, I've got four twisted pairs here, but you can see that only one pair was being used for the phone line. Here's my first blunder. You should know that the wiring in network cables is 24 gauge. My wire strippers only have slots up to 20 gauge. So what I'm doing here is something you should avoid if you can. I make a little incision in the insulation with the wire cutters and then rip the rest of it off to expose the wire. In doing this, it is easy to inadvertently damage the wire and damaged wire with current flowing through it generates heat, which could burn your house down Here's an example of me struggling at two times speed to get this insulation off. Okay, that's enough, buddy. When inserting the wire ends into the fitting, the goal is to make a solid connection with the metal, including the screw. So some people create a loop and loop it around the screw. I'm being lazy here. Don't be like me, even though my project worked. My connection is a point-to-point -point connection, and I'll explain more about this later at the network box, so I don't technically have to get the coloring right. 
I just have to be consistent. I'm gonna do it right anyway because I don't want the next homeowner to think I was a jack wagon. Now this wire is a little bit old, so it's kind of brittle. If you break off an end, I'd recommend trimming the wires so they're the same length. It'll help for attaching them to the wall plate. Like I said, the wiring is pretty brittle, so be careful when you put it back into the electrical box. The old telephone company decided to put the network box outside where they could get to it. If mine was in the house, it'd probably be in a closet or laundry room somewhere and I'd be able to install a cheap network switch so that all three ethernet ports were active and connected. But I wasn't able to find a network switch to my liking and didn't want to have to run power out here just for that. As you can see, we've got a mess of wires. There are three ethernet cables running out here. I have three jacks so I know I'm going to have to find out which wire goes to the master bedroom and which one goes to the front room. For now, I'm just going to clean things up a bit and get all of these wires free. This tan colored wire is likely how the phone company supplied power out to this box. I'm not sure, but I'm guessing because of the red and green wires for power and ground. Blunder number two was cutting these wires too much. I think at the time I was thinking, oh no, what if this little length of wire takes my newly attached ethernet cable over the 328 feet mark? Seriously? I'm untwisting each pair because I need to strip the insulation from the end and attach like colors. Essentially, I'm creating one ethernet cable from two. As long as I get the proper wires attached together at this point, it doesn't matter how I hook them up to the wall plate. I'll be honest, I watched a YouTube video about soldering two wires right before I did this part, so I'll link it here. Essentially, when you're soldering two wires together, you want to start off with a strong mechanical connection. Yes, the solder will essentially make the two wires into one, but your life will be easier both when you're soldering and after if you start with a good strong connection. The idea is that we're going to connect up these two ethernet cables and plug something in on both sides and it'll just work. Then I'd come back and solder up the connections and start on my next project. What was that one saying about the best laid plans of mice and men? I probably look grumpy because when I tested it, it didn't work. This is day number two. That tan colored brick there is called a breadboard. It is a relic from my computer engineering bachelor's program, 
and is really helpful for attaching wires together non-permanently. This is a case where I'm utilizing a tool that I don't expect the average viewer to have. Sorry. Now I knew I needed to find out which cable went from which room to the network box. And so what I planned on doing was applying a voltage across two of the wires and then checking it with my voltmeter at the network box just to make sure I had the right wire. I did this by attaching the white and white blue wires each to one terminal of a nine volt battery. Now batteries are really good at keeping two things a certain voltage distance apart, in this case nine volts. So I knew that I could go out to the network box and find the blue and white blue wire pair that were nine volts apart with my voltmeter. And then I knew that I'd have the right network cable. Now, if you're planning on using this method, method be careful. A nine volt battery probably won't burn your house down, but it could, if those wires inadvertently touch, fry those wires, and then you can't get 100 megabit per second ethernet to your front room. Of course, there are many good tools out there to help you identify continuity, but there's probably none that beat a 9 volt battery on price and reliability. After verifying that I could get a signal from the router in my master bedroom, through the ethernet cable to the network box, through the breadboard, through the ethernet cable to the front room, to a laptop I had there, I was ready to make the connection permanent by soldering the wires. I'm correcting blunder number three right here. I planned on using heat shrink tubing to help protect the connection, but you can also use electrical tape. Heat shrink tubing does just what its name says. The tube shrinks when exposed to heat. This is handy for electrical connections. Only you can't apply heat shrink tubing to your connection after you've soldered it together. Don't forget to slide the heat shrink on first. If you're going to be doing more electrical stuff, you probably ought to own a soldering iron. If you're not comfortable with it, practice soldering random wires together, cut the connection, and practice again. There are lots of great YouTube tutorials on how to solder correctly. I use the soldering iron to supply the heat to the heat shrink tubing, but there are special heat guns for this too. Isn't this just beautiful? We'll have to find some way to make the cable look better, but I'm getting full speed internet out here. Let me know what you think of my project in the comments or by giving me a thumbs up.